So what do we learn from this passage immediately preceding the verses in question? We learn that the Bible regards rape as a horrific and violent act, and it's even comparable to murder. One of the biggest objections, as you uh, mentioned earlier, is based on a passage from Deuteronomy 22. Feminists will claim that um, rape victims were required to marry their rapists. That rape victim, that if a man rapes a woman, then he could just basically buy the woman from um, her, uh, you know, he could buy the woman from her father, you know, so the father sells the rape victim to the rapist. And then she has to, the rape victim has to be married to a rapist. And so this is understandably a really big problem <laughs> with, with uh, feminists and, and with anyone, you know, I mean, that, that's very troubling if that's true. But that's not what, what's going on here. That's not what the passage actually teaches. The, the basis for this objection is in Deuteronomy 22, uh, 28 through 29. And basically, just to give a really quick summary, it teaches that when a man, quote unquote, seizes a young virgin and has sex with her, he is to pay her father 50 shekels of silver and marry her. He is also never allowed to divorce her. So feminists will claim that this passage is clear proof that the Bible regards women as the property of men and uh, that, you know, according to feminists, the female victim in this passage is sold to the rapist who violently attacked and degraded her. So how do we address this dip difficult objection? Well, this is a little bit nuanced, but it's once you once you see this, it's very clear that um, something more is going on here. If you go up a little bit further in the passage, you see that the the passage in question is preceded by legislation in verses twenty five through twenty seven that clearly do address rape. So rape is is definitely addressed in uh, 25 through 27. And since you have it up on the screen, I'll just read it real quick. But if a man finds a betrothed young woman in the countryside and the man forces her and lies with her, then only the man who lay with her shall die. So only the man shall die. But you shall do nothing to the young woman. There is in the young woman no sin deserving of death. For just as when a man rises against his neighbor and kills him, even so is this matter. For he found her in the countryside, and the betrothed young woman cried out, but there was no one to save her. So right here is a clear depiction of rape. According to verses 25 through 27, if a man seizes, and that word there is chazak, if he seizes a woman in an open field, the Torah demands that the man be put to death. But the young woman is presumed innocent in this case, because uh, nobody heard her cries for help. So what's interesting about this passage, and keep in mind, this passage appears directly before the passage in question, is that this passage uses a different Hebrew word for seizes than is used in verse 28. The verb chazak has a basic meaning of to be strong, and it can refer to, uh, uh, K the scholar Katie McCoy says, quote, it can refer to, quote, the violent overpowering of another, and in the context of this text, clearly denotes rape. So we're, there's no question that we're dealing with rape in verses uh, 25 through 27. So what do we learn from this passage immediately preceding the verses in question? We learn that the Bible regards rape as a horrific and violent act, and it's even comparable to murder. Because the, the verse in 26, it says, for this case is like that of a man attacking and murdering his neighbor. So the Bible teaches that rape is comparable to murder and that the man should be put to death for it. The woman in this scenario is portrayed as a victim who is worthy of justice. She's a victim worthy of justice. She's not the property of men. And by the way, this is unlike other ancient law codes in the middle, like, like the Middle Assyrian laws, for example, which actually called for retaliatory rape upon an assailant's wife. So if someone 
if a, a married man raped a woman, then that man's wife would have to be taken and raped in the middle of Syrian laws. So you kind of have, you know, innocent people suffering for the crimes of others. Not so in the Torah. The Torah upholds actual justice. And uh, it upholds, as we see, the value and the personhood of women by punishing the rapist. Um, so when we get to verses 28 through 29, we discover that they seem to describe a very different type of situation than what's described in the verses immediately preceding them. While verses 25 through 27 certainly do speak of rape, what verses 28 through 29 speak of is a young couple's consensual sexual encounter. Basically, it's talking about fornication. This, um, by the way, there's a few ways that this can be established. Um, as I already mentioned, uh, the Hebrew word for seizes is different in this passage than it is in the passage immediately preceding it. The word for seizes in verse 28 is tafas. And um, it generally means, it generally does mean to capture or seize, but unlike chazak, which is used in the uh, verse preceding it, it does not carry the same connotation of force. So there's a nuance here. Um, in fact, when rape is described later in, in the Hebrew scriptures and later stories where, where rape is, is depicted again, Chazak, not tafas, is the word that is used. And you can see this in Judges 19, as well as uh, 2 Samuel 13, when, when rape is described in those cases. Chazak is used, not tafas. So the question, and it's a very reasonable question, if the biblical author intended to describe rape in verses 28 through 29, if that's what he was talking about, wouldn't it be reasonable to think that he would use the word chazak as he does in the verses immediately preceding it? But he doesn't. In addition to um, not carrying the same connotation of force, um, the term tafas is used in metaphors that speak of things like God capturing the heart of Israel. And we see this in Ezekiel 14.5. So, the, the use of this word in nonviolent metaphors, like capturing the heart, is actually led many scholars to believe that the man in Deuteronomy 22, 28, he doesn't seize the woman in a forceful way. He doesn't seize her physically, but he seizes her heart. He seizes her emotionally. He captures her heart. And that is what is being described in verses 28 through 29. This is describing a consensual sexual encounter with a young couple. And this is made all the more clear when you look at the parallel passage in Exodus 22, uh, verses 16 through 17. This passage in Exodus, it, it describes the exact same situation as, as what we read in Deuteronomy 28, uh, 22, 28 through 29. This is what it says in Exodus. Um, and if you want to pull it up, or do you have it up? Exodus 22, 16 through 17. Okay, I got my numbers fixed up. There we go. Try no problem. There we go. All right, got it. All right, I'll read it on yours. It says, if a man entices, entices, other translations say seduces, if, it, if a man entices a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall surely pay the bride price uh, for her to be his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money according to the bride price for virgins. So what Deuteronomy is doing is it's elaborating on this legislation in Exodus. And, and remarkably... Rather than the word seizes, which is what uh, Deuteronomy uses in most translations, the Exodus passage uses the verb pata, the Hebrew verb pata, which means seduces. Okay? So in light of this parallel legislation in Exodus, it's likely that the section in Deuteronomy does not deal with rape, but with seduction. The young man seduced 
you know, the young woman into engaging in cons in a consensual sexual encounter. And uh, that is what is being described. So in light of that, so it's not rape, all right? Uh, but that certainly doesn't suggest that the woman wasn't mistreated, okay? So the woman still was mistreated. Um, the man, from the, from the Torah's perspective, the man still violated her, even though she consented to sex, he still violated her and dishonored her because he didn't give her the dignity of marriage before, you know, it's seducing her into engaging in sexual relations. So what the Torah do, is doing here is it's um, holding the man accountable for his behavior. It's, uh, you know, making sure that he's responsible for his actions and it's giving instructions on how to handle this situation to restore honor to the young woman, to mm -hmm. make sure that she is protected. Um, and, you know, that's, that's all this is saying. It's not saying that a rape yeah. victim must marry her rapist. It's saying that if a man seduces a young woman into engaging in consi consensual sex, then the man must uh, be held responsible and he must treat that woman with honor and dignity like she deserves. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I hope this video blessed you. If you liked it, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts in the comments below. Also, please subscribe and hit the notification bell so that you'll be notified when I release more content like this. Thank you again. Blessings and Shalom.